But coming back to, to um, uh, God led, led him astray knowingly. You see, this is, um, I'm trying to demonstrate the legitimate character of the Sufi position, which is part of a general effort to demonstrate the diversity of viewpoint in Islam in this era that included paradoxical and often op opposite interpretation of Quranic verses from what the norm was, which today is utterly absent, where everything is treated in a literalist fashion, a simplistic fashion, a reductionist fashion, that doesn't benefit humanity, doesn't benefit people in terms of their spiritual path. If they really read the story of, of um, of Yusuf, they would see the wisdom, the wisdom of, of God's guiding people astray at different points in our lives. Because what I was saying to you is we should be careful about jumping to conclusion about mistakes that we make. We should be patient with ourselves and hope that people are patient with us as God guides us. But we should always make sure that our relationship is with God, asking Him, why do I have this passion? Why am I finding myself attracted to intermediaries? We can think about it better by understanding, first of all, that Quranic stories, they, they are intended to be digested. So they're not, they're not um, intended to remain at a distance. They're intended to be taken in and understand that not only are these it, it's a mythical history. So if you prefer, if you if you, somebody says, well, no, it's the literal history, but for the Sufi, this is also a mythical world, meaning an imaginal world, and whether they happen in this world that you prefer to call real, or they happen in the imaginal world, which the Sufis say is more real, the point is that they happen in the language of revelation, which is the, the sentences and the words of God and therefore they are part of the general story of the Qur'an, which is how the soul can return to its creator. And sometimes this happens through um, an unexpected medicine, because people who think they are already well, but are actually sick, they, it's a tricky business to give them medicine, and maybe God will do it in a way uh, that is contrary to their expectation. And we gave examples. Already we had Aaron and Moses that we were going to try to find in ourselves. one of them representing the, the path of Tanzi and the path of transcendence mainly, that's Moses, and one of them representing the path of Tashbi, which is Aaron. And they don't exclusively represent those paths, but they are strong in those two paths. We looked at the story of uh, of uh, Yusuf and uh, Zulekha, and we see in there also aspects of the self and, and the, the nature of being led astray for ultimately the soul being able to return to God. And where we left off is we were going to read a little bit further in uh, Khorazmi's commentary, which is a commentary on Ibn Arabi's passage in the Fusus on Harun. And now we come to um, a passage where he says, Wa mano onas ke asnom wa gairho as maabudot bahawa ibodat kadami shavat. And he says, and the meaning of this this whole uh, teaching, in other words, is that uh, idols, meaning uh, stone idols and any other kinds of idols, they become objects of worship through passion. Only through passion do they become objects of worship. Wahawaham bazotehish. 
عبادت کردن می آید و هوا هم بذات خیش که هوا هست عبادت کردن می آید He says and even passion itself through its own essence which is passion can be worshipped because when God said earlier um, have you not seen the one who has taken for his God passion you see so clearly he's commenting on the meaning of that that not only it's a very interesting layer upon meaning so on the one hand um, passion itself it turns out being an aspect of wujud can be worshipped just as let's say mercy is an aspect of wujud meaning the aspect of Allah uh, any of these things in and of themselves can be worshipped and so he's taking this Quranic line have you not seen the one who is taking for his God passion and, and here the commentator is commenting on this and saying that even passion through its own essence which is passion can become the object of worship now we have a little bit of a parallel in a, not in the spiritual sense but in the external sense when we hear people say something like um, he or she has fallen in love with love itself uh, I see Zaki nodding what does that mean when somebody says that I, would, I believe it means that you're able to understand what the, the source of love. Yeah, so it can mean it either in a negative or a positive thing. So it's a negative thing. Then really it means more that desire. That that's why a person maybe never settles down. Because you find these people, they they are in a relationship for two months and another relationship for two months and another relationship for two months because they actually are in love with the rush they're not in love with the person they're in love with the rush this is a negative sense of that meaning and 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 unfortunately it's very easy to fall into that trap because there may be no guidance a person may have no guidance in their cultural context and the problem is among other things that it's a big waste of time usually only realize years later by someone when they could have had love but they didn't have love because they were they had fallen in love with the rush of infatuation they have confused infatuation with love or lust you could say even they confuse lust with love huh? so but here's a different meaning entirely which is that when a person sees um, that it is only through love and passion that one can worship one ultimately sees that love is wujud itself and so they worship that in and of itself which is a good thing so it's a different thing so let's see what the what else he says here Yeah, so where he says, uh, So it is, uh, and the, the intention of this discourse is that the greatest and the highest uh, um, uh, existence of, of, of Hawa itself, of passion itself, uh, in that which the people are worshipping. That it is the highest one. Vashik, Khodisasirahu, that Futuhat Miguyat, that Bazi Makoshefot, the Hish Hawara, Mushaida Kardam, Zoheran, Bauluhiat, Wakaed, Bar Arshish Wa Jamie Abuduhu Abuduhuish Bar Hawali Bar Hawali U 
مجتمع و نزد حضرت او واقف و هیچ معبودی از سوار کونیه اعظم از او ندیدم از هوا گپ میزند و شک یعنی شک ابن العربی قدس از سیروبو در فتوحت فتوحت یکی از کتاب مشهورش فتوحت المکیه در فتوحت میگیه که در بعضی مکاشفات خیش هوا را مشاهده کردم ظاهرا و الوهیت و قائد بر عرشش و جمعی عبدوهش بر حوالی که او مجتمع و نزد حضرت او واقع و هیچ معبودی از سوبر کونیه ازم از او ندیدم So Ibn Arabi is saying that he, in his makashifat uh, means uh, kashva, kardan, uh, revelations, unveilings. He says, um, in a number of these unveilings uh, of mine, I saw passion, I witnessed passion visibly, openly, um, at the level of divinity and established on the ash, on the throne of God. And all of the worshippers that were surrounding it and had gathered in its presence and were stationed there, and I have seen no greater object of worship in all of the forms of the universe greater than passion. That's pretty strong. So this is quoting from the Sheikh in Futuhat. Um, and now, as I said, he's talking about uh, the Sheikh in the Arabic. He says, uh, <coughs> Wazallahu Allahu Allah El. Or if you wish, because it's Mudil, huh? Wazallahu Allahu Allah El. God led him astray with knowledge, knowingly. Yene Allah Hayrat, he says, according to perplexity, through perplexity. So, um, یعنی نمیبینید علم حق را به آشیا و مشاهده نمی نمایی غایت کمال ذاتش او را که در حق عابد هوا چگونه تطمیم بدین مقال کرد که و عدله و الله و الله علم و زلالت یعنی دلالت حیرت است so he says do you not see the knowledge that God has that God gains through the things that God has through the things of the world and do you not witness, are you unable to witness the full extent of the completeness and the perfection <coughs> of his essence um, through them which in the uh, reality of the worshipper of passion has become perfected to such a level that we have the words and he guided um, he, he made them go astray according to knowledge you see so in other words what he's trying to say here is you have the essences of the things and the things of this world and God's knowledge of the things themselves in it as they are 
is that they are uh, they have potentials and limitations and one of their limitations is that they are uh, in their makeup the human being for example is guided by passion just like in another section of the Fusus, he's talking about in Ilyas how they are guided by waham, by supposition and imagination. So he's talking about the human formation and what is it that makes it so vast. Um, isn't it true that much of the time imagination might make us also go astray? So now we have two things which normally are looked at in a negative and pejorative fashion by the maybe by the theologians, but which the Sufis regard them as part of human nature. So the faculty of, of imagination and, and the faculty and the, and the potential for passion, these are part of the human makeup, part of the makeup of nafs. And, and therefore the, the, the human being can make a mistake uh, do you think that maybe God made Adam um, go astray knowingly? Did Ustad say that Adam was made to go astray knowingly? What did what Faisal, what did Ustad say? What was so knowing about this? He said that Adam was created for the earth, not for the state. Yeah. So, in other words, if you were reading the story in a very literalist way, you would be it would be difficult for you to criticize Adam. But actually God criticizes Adam, doesn't he? Wasn't he? What is, how does God criticize Adam? He says, I found him lacking in one thing. What did he find him lacking in? In Quran, God says, I found him lacking in resolution. Azam. You can see for yourself. It's in Quran. So, but that's not a put down, it's a compliment because he's saying the problem with the angels is they have too much resolution. They can't change their minds, they have no range with, within which to change their minds. For the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, God says, God makes the Prophet, peace be upon him, understand that the heart is spinning between the fingers of God. When he goes astray, when he comes to the house of Zaid and he sees Zainab. You see what I mean? There's this business of being led astray knowingly is, is not necessarily a negative thing. And in the case of Adam, you cannot have this world. As Ustad said, it's because Adam was actually made for this world. So this whole story of him being led astray by the snake, this is Bahana, right? Ustad says it's Bahana for the real intention because Adam would come down to this world and the human story would begin. What is the human story? It's the story of the soul. The soul that descends into the levels of manifestation of the divine names and then finds its way back into God. Huh? It gets lost and it finds its way back. This is the story, isn't it, of the soul. The soul is in perfection in the last and the soul descends into this domain and is immediately either swallowed by the whale, like Jonah, if it's a prophet, or if it's like us, we fall into the whale of the body, the Sufis say. We are also Jonah, and we are swallowed by the senses, according to the Sufis. And we must experience suffering, and then we will cry out to God, right? cries out to God in suffering, and God then liberates him, Jonah I mean, and therefore can liberate the soul. So the Sufis see all of these stories in Quran in this manner, in the same manner. And we can see many stories like this. I'm giving you several examples tonight of these stories. And here, uh, what he's saying is, um, it's because of his, his knowledge and the perfection of his knowledge, you see, the perfecting of his knowledge, that um, um, as he says, um, what 
این قول و تطمیم مبنی به آن است که حق سبحانه و تعالی چون دید که عابد هوا را پرستش نمی کند مگر به انقیاد و طاعت هوا بر آنچه امر می کند عبادت شخصی از اشخاص کرده از اشخاص که مبود اوست و جواب بعد از این خواهد آمد که و عدله و الله و الله علم ای حیرت الله علم so he says in the, the this, these words uh, 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 and, and the perfection the perfecting of these meanings they are, the, they are uh, based upon um, the knowledge of the Haq when he saw that the worshipper of passion, that for the worshipper of passion, uh, there is no, um, uh, for the devotee of passion, there is no worshiping of him except through the submission and, and obedience to that passion, meaning conforming with that passion in what it uh, commands uh, him to do, meaning it actually is, is driving the worshiper. So it drives Zulekha to do what she's doing, for example. She is literally under its command at that point. Huh? For the worship, uh, individual worship of the various, uh, the personal worship of all of various people in what they worship, it is through the passion. Huh? Um, so he gives an answer. What does he mean in answer? Where, where in answer to, is there a question in the Quranic verse? Yes, the earlier verse you may recall was, Afaraita manitahada ilahahu hawahu. Have you not seen the one who takes for his God passion? See, that's the question. And he says in the answer, the answer after that naturally must come. Uh, and he led him astray, God led him astray with full knowledge, meaning according to knowledge. Led him, him or her astray. Huh? And, and in other words, perplexity. So now he reintroduces this idea according to perplexity. What is perplexity? It is what the women felt when they were cutting their hands when they saw Joseph. Perplexity is what the Sufi experiences through the tajaliyat. Uh, they are in the position of those women because they cannot explain. They no longer even feel themselves. They're really in tajrid. Tajrid is technically when you no longer are aware of what you of your sense of what you sense in yourself. So those women, they are actually Sufis, all of them, they're all nafs, because huh? they are women. So in the in the parable they they are in the place position of being the nafs of these people. And as you recall, the nafs is on a journey from nafs amore, nafs laome to nafs mutmainna. And they are on this journey and they are now in Tajrid because they no longer are aware of themselves when they cut themselves. That is the point, isn't it? They are only fully absorbed in perplexity. They can't explain the beauty. They know that it's supposed to be a human being and they see that it's not a human being. And they say this is not a human being. They say this is an angelic being, right? Same thing. So he goes on. Wa'in is lal e mabnias bar ilme azim ke hosel as hak ke hosel as as hak ba asrar e tajaliotesh dar in suvar wa hoyotesh. Yani in is lal wa hayrat nabud. مگر از علم عظیم حق و مجالی هوا و آیان بندگان 
و طلب استعداد را ایشان مر این مجالی را so we'll stop there for a minute he says and this causing them to err is in fact uh, based in the knowledge of God in the is, is, is based on a very profound and great knowledge which is um, arrived at from the Haq um, through the secrets of the divine theophanies manifesting within the forms of things without limit. In other words, this being led astray and this perplexity could not be except for this profound and great knowledge of the Haq, of the locus of manifestation of passion and the essences of the worshippers and the requirements of the predispositions that they have in regard to this locus of manifestation. Tahak ibadat kardashavat barwasite hawa dar jamie suvare bujudia wa marate be kamnia ta dar hayrat arad arefan ra ba kastrate tajaliyat wa tana wa e zuhurat wa hayran sazat mahjubin ra ke chiguna dar in suvare kamnia basta and del chiguna del dar in suvare kamnia basta and wa ibadat u پیش گرفته با وجود آن که می داند که آن چه می پرستند اله موجد ایشان نیست بلکه مثل ایشان ممکنی است از ممکنات و با این همه در بواطن خیش میل عظیم به سوی معبود خیش می آبند pretty interesting stuff um, so he goes on to say uh, so all of this earlier thing that we said so that the Haq meaning God would be worshipped um, through the mediacy uh, meaning because of passion in all of the forms of existence and in all of the levels of creation um, so that it brings into perplexity the Gnostics, the Arfan. Um, through the multiplicity of the theophanies and in through the and through the diversity of the types of manifestations. And it causes perplexity for those who are veiled about how can it be that the heart um, can be uh, held in the grips of these forms of the cosmos even though these people know that that which they are worshipping is not the God that created them. On the contrary, it is something like them which is only ephemeral and perishable. And despite all of this, they, they, ha they hold within themselves such a yearning, such a great yearning towards these objects of worship that they have found. It's a pretty, pretty interesting, huh? A little bit difficult, but pretty interesting. 
uh, are you are you grasping what he's saying there? That that um, there's there's God's knowledge of the forms of the cosmos and what their capacities are. If you are the Lord of all of the worlds, and if you are Rafiu Darajat, and you remain exalted at any level, then you delight in the pleasure grounds of any sort that you could manifest in, be worshipped in. And the Lord of the universe is the creator of these many levels and locus uh, theaters of manifestations. And so at each level, um, as we become more embodied and go from Lahut towards Nasut, there is going to be at the level of, of for example, Nasut and Malakut, we are going to enter really profoundly powerful levels of passion and desire. Because starting from the angels and all they do is they're turning in setayesh, in, in worship of God, but without love, you, you, you now descend into the level of nafs and you have niayesh, which is the, the worship, which is the ash uh, that he talked about, where Ibn Arabi saw Hawa, it's the place of desire. It's the place of desire. Not surprising that Ibn Arabi calls his poetry Tadraman al Did you read it, Rahman Chan? That's beautiful. So the, the interpreter of desires, it's the same thing. It's about the path of desire and how God uses desire uh, not only to descend and permeate all of the world of form, but to use the same thing as a device to return the form back into the transcendental. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is, is called the Hatam. Why is he the Hatam? What's, why is that? He's the last, but he's, he's actually the seal. Uh, and, and the seal has a lot of meaning. So, for example, we find out that Adam is a kind of seal. The seal is the thing on the ring, and it's pressed into the wax. And when you see the seal, you will obey the order that's opened up because of the seal that's on the, the wax, you see? And in this case, the seal is the last because um, the Sufis say that uh, what is the first to exist is the last to appear. You see, the first one to exist. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, represents this. He's the last to appear because he is in the station of Jamul Jam. He is, ga- he is the gathering of everything together. Is why he says, Ubiba ilaya. Completion of the circle. Ubiba ilaya min dunyakum thalatan. Anasau watibu wajule atna korate aini fi salwat. You have made beloved to me three things in your world the beauty of the women. So if it's a, he means the beauty of, of the person. So if you're a woman, whatever that means to you, you see, for man, whatever that means to you, the beauty of the beloved human being. He is starting with this. He is starting with this because if we read him, he says, this is, uh, I gave in my talk, I explained in London, huh, in, in Oxford, uh, this is the path to God. The Ishkema Josi is the path to God for him. And he talks about God has a relationship to man, and man, and God says, I pull from my nafs man, I blow my spirit into it, and man pulls from his own essence the woman. So in the fable of the descent 
of spirit and soul, how these things are related to each other, you see. So he starts by saying, uh, uh, you have made beloved to me three things in this world. Uh, that which is actually me, which was pulled out of me, which is spirit. This follows the pattern, of course, of aklikul and nafsikul. Huh? But these are not about men and women or power struggles and feminism or anything like that. This is all about the soul and the intellect and the spirit. This is what this is about. And anyone can wear any of these, these aspects, the feminine, the masculine, anybody can wear these aspects, okay? So, so but what we see here is um, Muhammad, peace be upon him, starts by acknowledging where he is, he's, he's positioned in this world. And he says, you have made three things beloved to me. The women, the perfume. The perfume, huh? It said that uh, Shagufa's uh, wedding, huh? We ta I talked about the perfume, the perfume of love between the believers, the perfume of love between uh, two lovers, whoever they may be, the perfume of, of intimacy, the perfume that Jacob came to gain his sight from this perfume. You see? This perfume, the spirit. And, um, and the solace or the joy of my eyes was made to be the prayer. So we see uh, the completion in, his, in this statement about that Muhammad makes peace be upon him, about his position in this. And there's room for going astray uh, as part of a cycle. Uh, did God go astray? Is he not the one who created the creatures who go astray? Is he not the one who created and gives power to Satan to guide people astray? Does Satan actually have power to guide people astray without God's permission? Or does Satan have to have God's permission to guide people astray? You see? So the, the Sufi doctrine is, is, is complicated. But the best way to understand it is through these stories in the Quran. Whether it's about Zulaikha. It's about, in other words, things we thought were saved may not have been saved. Maybe they were in big trouble. And maybe we only find out when we open the packaging how much trouble people are in. And maybe God realizes what trouble people are in with their arrogance. And so he causes them to go astray knowingly for their own sake. He realizes they are astray and they think they are on the right path. So he may cause them to go astray. Or he may cause them to go astray in a rather benign way. Like Moses is looking for fire and he causes Moses to take a detour, we could say. Moses has passion for something. At that moment he actually has passion for some, finding some fire. He's kind of cold, they need to cook food. So his passion is rather material. And he also is looking for some guidance. And these fires are put out at night, meaning they're they're burnt at night, awful to guide people. You see, like you're in the desert and they make fires, and that way you see this fire and some people, they will charge you money when you get to this, okay, give me a few cents because I'm burning this fire so that you can travel at night. If I didn't have this fire, you would have gone someplace else, you see. So Allah creates a fire that's off the beaten track, so to speak. And Moses goes there because of his desire. But when he gets there, is he surprised? Of course he's surprised. <laughs> he's surprised because instead of finding uh, a little bit of information, he finds a burning bush that's turning greener and greener the more it burns, and this burning bush is saying, truly I am God. At that moment, he would have been forgiven if he said, if he said, um, you know, um, <coughs> right? He would have been forgiven. Because he's not supposed to see a burning bush. A thing is saying, I am God. He should, he's throwing stones at it, maybe. But no, he has enough. He is actually in, already in Hayrat. 
So he, he cannot do anything. He is like uh, somebody that's been stung by a scorpion. They're like, uh, they're like this, you see. So, so, <laughs> so he just, all he can do is be in hairat. He is in like bliss and intoxication and God is speaking to him and God is teaching him. So, but he has been guided astray, has he not? On deliberately, God guided him astray according to knowledge. See, this is the way the Sufis understand these passages. Remember always that this is not about um, tricking other people. This is about a relationship with God when we are suddenly faced with paradoxical feelings that we are trying to understand what God is teaching us. And if we make a mistake, um, what is supposed to be a mistake in the eyes of the people, we may have had no choice in the matter. Zulekha, uh, not only did she have Hema, what she really meant is what he said in here. He says the Amr, that passage, he said the, that the Hawa is commanding them. See, the Hawa is commanding her. It's coming from God. It's got Hawa, as Ibn Arabi says, he goes to the Arsh, and Hawa is the supreme, <laughs> the pre, the supreme manifestation on the Arsh. The Arsh is the throne, and the, the throne is looking down and is seeing a situation, and says, "Oh yes, it's time again for the story. Start the clock." The clock starts to tick. Joseph appears in Egypt delivered from the well. He sold in the slave market. He goes into the court. He's still young, but when he reaches adolescence, the day he enters into adolescence, the alarm will go you know, on the clock and she like <laughs> falls in passion for him and love for him. He becomes the manifestation of perfect beauty. She, she is commanded by Hawa. She's commanded by passion. She no longer has any choice in the matter. She's a crazy woman who is going to break the law. She is willing to break the law. He is not willing to break the law, even though he is desirous for her, meaning he is Ru and she is Nafs, and they're desiring each other. But she is Nafs and she is not cooked yet. So she's going to get cooked and he's going to get cooked. But she gets cooked because uh, she makes a mistake. There's a a wise Sufi commentator on the side just giving a footnote, like look and see whether the thing was torn in the back or the front, and that takes the story further, and we find out that, that she's now going to be humiliated by, by the, the good people of the kingdom. What do you think? The good people of the kingdom? By the arrogant, um, fanatical, lunatic, um, extremist people who judge everybody. That's who these women are who come to see him, on the one hand. On the other hand, there are dervishes who need to be doing a little cleaning house, you see. So they arrive and they sit there in front and there are these women and she says, oh yeah, give them some fruit and be sure to sharpen the knives. Huh? <laughs> so they sharpen the knives and they give her the fruit and they bring him out and, 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 and that's all she needs to do. She, all she needs to do is bring him out and say, oh, no, we will see, we will see. <laughs> they are there, they, they go into Tajrid. They actually are in like Fana. They are like seeing him and they can't believe it. They say, this is not a human being. This is an angelic being. Now we understand. But there's, they don't, there's no time in the story for them. It's like, Psh, they're off to the side. We don't hear about them anymore. All of them, they went after that in some path and they found their way to God. We just don't hear about it. But for sure, they already had cut themselves with uh, wisdom. So now they, they are wounded, the nafs is wounded, and they find their way, some way back to God. Well, they're out of the story. It's too long of a story otherwise. So we, now we only hear the rest of the story about how she was led astray, how he was led astray, and how they individually made mistakes and had to pay for that. What, why would, did Joseph... How was he led astray? Why did he have to pay for that? In the prison, how was he? What what was his crime? He asked the king to help him instead of God. He asked the help of somebody in the place of God. So he made a mistake because he's a human being. 
And like Adam, he lacks resolution. It's not that he didn't know that. He knew that, but in that moment he slips. And he lacked resolution and he made a mistake, even though he knew full well the whole story of Joseph is his trust of God. But in that moment he made a mistake because God made him go astray knowingly. Why did he make him go astray knowingly? What was going to happen in the prison? He interpreted the dreams. He was going to interpret the dreams and he was going to save a whole nation. And he was also going to guide the prisoners who are in a state of imprisonment and despair and affliction. He was going to guide them to righteousness. So the prison is a horrible place, but he will guide them. They become his helpers, his friends. They don't become bad people. They become good people because he's there. So he has a purpose in being guided astray, like Adam has a purpose in being guided astray, you see. So when you're trying to understand this doctrine, just think about all these stories in Quran. And think about how if you fall in love with something, this flower, a human being, uh, a doctrine, uh, something of this world, if you fall in love with something, this flower, a human being, uh, a doctrine, uh, something of this world. Uh, Ibn Arabi doesn't limit it. He might see a teenage boy falling in love with a Camaro, not a, a, a young girl. You see what I mean? I'm, no, that, for Ibn Arabi, is anything that causes you to fall in love is God guiding you astray knowingly. Because in that moment, the Camaro appears to be the most complete form of beauty in the whole world through, through likeness. The, the young man wants a fast, shining, beautiful persona to drive down the road, you see? So it could be anything. For Ibn Arabi, he also doesn't limit it to, to um, worship. He talks about tashkir, dominance. And he says that um, it is possible uh, that people, they, they worship aspects of dominance, like they maybe they worship an office. They say, I really worship, I really want to become the mayor of the town. Because then they're worshiping uh, what becomes beautiful for them, their object of worship is what it, it represents dominance, which is a shadow of God's dominance. You see, so he doesn't limit it to Usually Rumi and Hafez, they are, they are keeping it within the story of love, and Ibn Arabi is going to extend this story a little bit. And I'm not sure we will take, for now we will, we will pause this exploration, because we've explored it pretty thoroughly in three meetings, I think. But this is the doctrine of the wisdom of God in guiding people astray. And it's another aspect of flexible interpretation, which as I mentioned earlier today, if you look at the Qanunat Awile uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he says that this is the rules or the, the rules of interpretation of Quran and of Hadith. He says there are not just the Zahir category, which is Hesi, either the Zati, Hesi, Khayali, Akli, and Majazi. And he says you can interpret from any one of these five perspectives and you are not an unbeliever if you should interpret from any one or several of these perspectives. Contrary to what the people even in his time says, he says don't call them unbelievers because they are interpreting in one of these other non hesi meaning sensible and experiential, they are interpreting in one of these other ways. Don't judge them, he says. Don't um, make them apostates. Don't, don't say takfir against them, because you don't understand what we learned from Ibn Abbas and the earliest of the Rashidun and from the Salaf that that the Salaf of today seem to have forgotten completely, that these things go back to the beginning, these forms of interpretation. And I'm giving you tonight one example of such interpretation by reading from the commentaries and from these stories, okay?